Recall the poignant memory of Judy Garland, the globally renowned actress and singer celebrated for her captivating performance as the female protagonist in the acclaimed musical End of the Rainbow. Blessed with natural talent, Judy earned widespread acclaim from critics and received numerous awards from Hollywood. Yet, behind the glittering facade of her success, Judy's tumultuous life journey left her fans heartbroken as they witnessed their beloved idol grappling with the shadows of addiction. To delve further into the intricacies of Judy's life, be sure not to overlook this video. Judy Garland's early life was marked by the harsh circumstances of her birth in Rapids, Minnesota, on a chilling June 10th in 1922 where temperatures plummeted to an astounding 40 degrees below zero. Born as Frances Ethel Gum, her arrival into the world was fraught with the financial anxieties of her parents, Frank and Markellis Gum. Living in their hometown of Minnesota, the Gum couple was already burdened by economic struggles, and the prospect of a third child intensified their worries. Faced with the daunting challenges that another mouth to feed would bring, Frank and Marcellus contemplated extreme measures. Desperation led them to consider inducing a miscarriage, and they tried everything within their means to terminate the pregnancy. However, fate had other plans, and their attempts proved unsuccessful. In the middle of a freezing night, Francis was born in New Rapids, Minnesota. The gravity of the situation became apparent when Frank, tense-faced and laden with the weight of their predicament, arrived at the doorstep of a family friend named Mark. The doorbell rang, prompting Mark to inquire about the troubled expression on Frank's face. The revelation that unfolded was a genuine tragedy in the making. The news that Sybil, Frank's wife, was pregnant again, and the couple could ill afford another child. Financial strain loomed, and Frank was desperate, seeking a solution to what he perceived as an unbearable situation. In a conversation that echoed the societal challenges of the time, Frank implored Mark to arrange an abortion for Sybil. Mark, however, responded with a stern refusal, advising Frank to go back to his wife and deliver a message that she must have the baby. This decisive moment in the family's history would shape Judy Garland's destiny. As Judy grew older, she emerged as the family favorite, her talent evident even in her early years. Referred to by the affectionate nickname Baby Gum, she showcased a remarkable affinity for music. As Judy Garland entered her pre-adolescent years, her artistic journey gained momentum through the careful guidance of her mother. Trained by her mother from an early age, Judy along with her two older sisters, formed a musical trio known as the Gum Sisters. The family act, marked by the harmonious blend of their voices, began to draw attention as they performed together. By the time Judy turned 11, the Gum Sisters had already started making a name for themselves in the world of music. Their performances resonated with audiences, showcasing the burgeoning talent within the family. The sisters' musical synergy was a testament to the dedication and training instilled by their mother, laying the foundation for Judy's future stardom. As their reputation grew, the Gum sisters received an exciting opportunity to showcase their talent in a short film. However, the entertainment industry, known for its emphasis on glamour and image, prompted a recommendation to rebrand itself with a more alluring name. The decision to move away from the familial gum surname was driven by a desire to project a more sophisticated and marketable image. Frances, who had developed a distaste for her childhood moniker, Baby Gum, seized this opportunity for reinvention. In an act of personal agency, she decided to adopt the name Judy. This transformation marked not only a shift in nomenclature, but also symbolized a coming of age for the young performer. The name change signaled a departure from the perceived limitations of childhood, embracing a new identity that would resonate with audiences on a broader scale. Ethel Gum's aspirations for a career in showbiz were fervent, and she pursued her dream alongside her husband by creating a theater. The Gum family's venture into the world of entertainment was an earnest attempt to live out Ethel's passion. 
Unfortunately, their theater faced financial challenges, and the family found themselves in the midst of hard times. Faced with adversity, Ethel, undeterred in her pursuit of showbiz success, identified a unique opportunity within her daughter's burgeoning talent. Judy Garland, at the tender age of 12, became a focal point in her mother's aspirations. Ethel, recognizing the potential for stardom in her daughter's gifted voice, became an ardent driving force behind the Gum Sisters' journey into the limelight. The pursuit of success, however, took a toll on the family, and Ethel's methods of motivation began to venture into troubling territory. Day in and day out, she relentlessly pushed her daughters to excel in their performances. To cope with the demands of a rigorous schedule, the family turned to the use of amphetamines in the morning. These stimulants were administered to ensure that the Gum Sisters were awake, alert, and ready for their demanding showbiz commitments. The use of amphetamines, though, was only one side of the story. As the night fell, the girls were given sleeping pills to facilitate rest and recovery. The cycle of stimulants during the day and sedatives at night became a routine, a regimen that took a toll on the well-being of young Judy Garland. At the tender age of 12, she found herself ensnared in a web of substance dependence, unwittingly beginning a journey into addiction. As Judy Garland matured, her natural beauty and undeniable talent set her apart from her sisters, positioning her as the standout performer within the Gum family. Ethel Gum, keenly observant of Judy's growing brilliance and realizing the potential she possessed, made a pivotal decision. Recognizing that Judy was overshadowing her siblings, Ethel decided to focus exclusively on fostering Judy's burgeoning career. With a mother's determination and a desire to fulfill her own aspirations vicariously through her daughter, Ethel actively sought opportunities for Judy in the entertainment industry. Audition after audition became a routine as Ethel tirelessly worked to propel Judy into the spotlight. The fall of 1935 marked a significant turning point in Judy's life. After a series of auditions, doors began to open, and a promising opportunity presented itself. Ethel, driven by both maternal pride and the ambition to see her daughter succeed, observed that Judy was not just talented, but truly extraordinary. As one observer noted, I think Judy's mother was living out her idea of what she had wanted to be as a singer. She had the three girls, and they were all talented, but Judy by far was the most brilliant. It became evident that Judy was destined for something more significant than the family performances that had shaped her early years. The turning point arrived when, at the tender age of 13, Judy Garland was offered a contract with MGM, one of the most prestigious film studios in Hollywood. The offer came from none other than Louis B. Mayer, the co-founder of MGM, who was captivated by Judy's exceptional performance. Mayer, recognizing a rare talent, was eager to harness Judy's potential and wasted no time in offering her a contract. Just two months after Judy Garland's momentous signing with MGM, the Gum family was thrust into a period of profound sadness with the sudden loss of her father. This heartbreaking event cast a somber shadow over what should have been a time of celebration and excitement for Judy's burgeoning career. In the face of this personal tragedy, Judy found herself compelled to carry on, not just for her own dreams, but also to honor the memory of her father. Continuing under contract with MGM, Judy encountered the challenges that often accompany a rapidly changing film industry. A significant hurdle emerged as she faced a dilemma regarding her age. At 13, she found herself in a peculiar position, too old to convincingly play child roles and too young to take on more mature characters. In the rigid structure of Hollywood casting, there seemed to be no defined space for a 13-year-old girl, and Judy found herself navigating the complexities of an industry that had yet to fully adapt to the nuances of adolescence. The solution to this predicament came in 1937 when Judy Garland secured a supporting role in the film Girl Next Door. This marked a critical breakthrough for her, allowing her to transition from the constraints of age-specific roles. 
In the film, she collaborated with the charismatic Mickey Rooney, forging a partnership that would define a significant portion of her early career. The bond between Judy and Mickey Rooney extended beyond the screen as the two became close friends. Their chemistry was undeniable, leading them to work together on over eight films. This collaborative synergy not only showcased their individual talents, but also demonstrated the magic that happens when two artists share a genuine connection. The film industry had found a winning formula in pairing Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney, and their on-screen partnership would contribute significantly to the success of the films they worked on together. At the delicate age of 14, Judy Garland's life took a more tumultuous turn as she grappled with additional challenges within the demanding confines of Hollywood stardom. The studio, keenly aware of the young actress's struggle to maintain what they deemed an appropriate weight, intervened in an attempt to address the issue. Traditional remedies like diet and exercise proved ineffective in Judy's case, prompting the studio to explore alternative solutions. Unbeknownst to the studio, Judy was already navigating a complex relationship with medication. Raised by a mother who had initiated a routine of amphetamines and sleeping pills, Judy was no stranger to the pharmacological landscape. As the studio sought a remedy for her weight concerns, they prescribed pills with the intention of assisting her. However, this unwittingly added to Judy's existing reliance on medication, deepening her connection to substances that would shape her life in unforeseen ways. Judy's daily routine, laden with the pressures of film production, became a cycle of dependency. After an exhaustive day of shooting, she returned home to a series of tasks. Dinner, script memorization, and a bath, all while contending with the side effects of her medication. The demands of her schedule, coupled with her high-strung and sensitive nature, left her unable to find rest naturally. This led to a troubling reliance on pills to induce sleep, creating a loop of medication that was both physically and emotionally taxing. Behind the scenes, the studio, motivated by the relentless pace of film production, inadvertently contributed to Judy's growing addiction. The pills, initially intended to manage her weight and facilitate productivity, became a double-edged sword. They were both a means to meet the demands of her career and a source of dependence that Judy found increasingly difficult to escape. In candid conversations, Judy confided in those close to her about the predicament she found herself in. She expressed a desire to break free from the cycle of medication, acknowledging the toll it was taking on her well-being. However, the structure of the industry at the time left her feeling trapped. The power dynamics were such that voicing opposition or refusing medication was perceived as insubordination. Judy felt she had no choice but to comply with the studio's directives, further entrenching her in the grip of addiction. In 1938, at the age of 17, Judy Garland received an extraordinary opportunity that would come to define her career and legacy the starring role in the feature film The Wizard of Oz. This significant milestone marked a turning point in her life, as she transitioned from a young and talented performer to a bona fide star. The prospect of leading such a high-profile project took over Judy's entire being, and she approached the role with a fervor and dedication that would characterize her work ethic throughout her career. Immersed in the world of The Wizard of Oz, Judy Garland became enamored with her work. The role of Dorothy became more than just a job. It became a passion that consumed her. Judy's commitment to her craft was evident in her tireless efforts to meet the demands of the grueling work schedule associated with such a major production. The film, released in 1939, emerged as a massive success and a landmark achievement for MGM standing out as one of the most expensive productions undertaken by the studio at that time. Judy's portrayal of Dorothy not only captivated audiences, but also solidified her status as a Hollywood icon. The premiere of The Wizard of Oz was a momentous occasion, and Judy, alongside her close friend Mickey Rooney, greeted adoring fans who had come to love and admire her. Despite the outward success and acclaim, 
Judy Garland's personal happiness was beginning to wane under the weight of external pressures. The dual pressures exerted by her mother and the studio began to take a toll on her well-being. The delicate balance between fame and personal fulfillment became increasingly elusive for Judy as she navigated the complex dynamics of the entertainment industry. In the midst of these challenges, Judy found solace and distraction in an unexpected source. She crossed paths with the talented composer David Rose, who was 12 years her senior. Despite protests from both the studio and Judy's mother, a connection blossomed between Judy and David. Drawn to his charisma and talent, Judy embarked on a romantic journey with Rose, offering a brief respite from the relentless demands of her professional life. In 1941, Judy Garland took a significant step in her personal life by marrying David Rose. Having lived an early life steeped in the relentless demands of the entertainment industry and the enduring pressures from her mother, this union with Rose represented a newfound chapter for Judy, one in which she hoped to find genuine happiness and escape from the constraints of her past. Marriage to David Rose offered Judy a sense of liberation from the constant scrutiny and direction she had experienced throughout her upbringing and career. It seemed to be a conscious choice to break free from the clutches of those who had dictated the trajectory of her life for so long. In the embrace of matrimony, Judy likely saw an opportunity to define her own path away from the watchful eyes and expectations that had accompanied her from a young age. To those who knew them, the couple radiated a sense of contentment. Friends and acquaintances noted the change in Judy's demeanor with David by her side. It was a period where she could step away from the spotlight and the incessant demands of the entertainment industry, finding solace in the companionship of her new husband. Reflecting on this time, those close to Judy observed that she might have married at a young age to liberate herself from the pervasive influence of others telling her what to do. The decision to marry David Rose allowed her to reclaim agency over her life and chart a course guided by her own desires and aspirations. The domestic scenes at Judy's home during this period exuded a sense of warmth and tranquility. Friends fondly recall the couple's hospitality, describing David as quiet but endearing and Judy as a charming hostess. It was a respite from the chaotic world of Hollywood, a place where Judy could revel in the simple joys of domestic life and the companionship of a partner who allowed her the space to be herself. In 1942, a mere year after her marriage to David Rose, Judy Garland received news that she was expecting a child. This revelation, which should have been a cause for celebration, instead set the stage for a tragic clash between personal desires and the ruthless demands of the studio and her mother. The prevailing belief within the MGM studio and her mother's perspective was that the arrival of a child would tarnish Judy's carefully crafted innocent image, a persona meticulously groomed over years in the limelight. Judy, however, was resolute in her determination to embrace motherhood. Firmly asserting her right to have the child, she communicated her belief that a baby would bring additional joy to her life. Unfortunately, the studio's priorities were firmly entrenched in maintaining the virginal image that audiences had come to adore, prioritizing this over Judy's personal happiness. Faced with this opposition, Judy's mother took her to an illegal clinic, where a heartbreaking decision was made to terminate the pregnancy. The aftermath of this traumatic experience left Judy not only physically affected but also emotionally devastated. The profound loss, combined with the relentless demands of her work schedule and an escalating reliance on medication, plunged Judy into a state of misery. In 1943, Seeking some semblance of relief from her overwhelming challenges, Judy Garland sought psychotherapy. However, the endeavor quickly turned into a tumultuous and emotionally charged battle. Those present in the room, Judy, her mother, and the influential Louis B. Mayer, co-founder of MGM, engaged in a heated debate about Judy's mental health and the appropriate course of action. Mayer, a powerful figure in the entertainment industry, 
expressed his concerns about the perception of MGM movie stars as unstable individuals. Tears streaming down his face, he emphasized the need for a mother's love for Judy and questioned the denial of such basic emotional support. Judy's mother, on the other hand, advocated for a disciplinary approach, insisting that what Judy needed was structure and control. In the midst of this emotional turmoil, a calm voice, that of a doctor, attempted to interject reason into the heated discourse. The doctor proposed psychotherapy as a means of helping Judy, suggesting that with a year of dedicated effort, significant progress could be made. However, time was of the essence, and the doctor warned that delaying intervention would only complicate matters further, potentially reaching a point where recovery was no longer feasible. In the midst of her personal and professional struggles, Judy Garland found herself working on her 18th feature film, Meet Me in St. Louis. At this juncture, Garland's enthusiasm for the role was notably diminished, and she felt that the character and dialogue did not align with her considerable talent. The weight of external pressures only exacerbated her dissatisfaction. However, the film's director, Vincente Minnelli, recognized the toll this was taking on Garland and understood her need for empathy and understanding. Vincente Minnelli, renowned for his directorial skills, took a compassionate approach to working with Judy Garland. Recognizing her exceptional talent and the challenges she faced, Minnelli became not just a director, but a source of support for the young actress. Understanding that Garland needed more than just professional guidance, Minnelli developed a close relationship with her, helping her navigate the complexities of her character and the pressures of the film industry. Under Minnelli's guidance, Judy Garland's perspective on her role in Meet Me in St. Louis underwent a transformation. Initially unenthusiastic, Garland began to approach her character with newfound care and commitment. The change in her performance was evident, and Minnelli's influence played a significant role in helping Garland find a deeper connection with her character. The intimate collaboration between Minnelli and Garland went beyond the confines of the film set. Garland, grappling with personal challenges, found solace and support in Minnelli's understanding and empathy. Their professional connection evolved into a personal one, and a romantic relationship blossomed between the talented actress and the charismatic director. In 1945, Judy Garland and Vincente Minnelli were married, marking a new chapter in both their lives. However, even in the midst of her apparent happiness, Garland faced warnings and speculations from friends and co-workers. Rumors circulated that Minnelli might be homosexual due to his feminine behavior. Observers noted his less conventional approach to masculinity and his use of makeup, even more than some actresses, raised eyebrows on set. Despite the persistent rumors surrounding Vincente Minnelli's sexuality, Judy Garland chose to overlook them, embracing a fulfilling life with her new husband. Their connection deepened, and before long, Garland found herself expecting another child. In a poignant gesture to please Minnelli, she even ceased taking her pills, showcasing her commitment to their relationship. This decision, however, revealed another layer of vulnerability as Minnelli became aware of Garland's ongoing struggle with addiction. Amidst her pregnancy, Garland continued to showcase her extraordinary talent by starring in the film Till Clouds Roll By. The audience marveled at her beautiful voice and appearance, acknowledging her prowess despite the physical challenges of pregnancy. This period marked a delicate balance for Garland as she navigated the demands of her career while experiencing the joys and complexities of impending motherhood. In 1946, Judy Garland and Vincente Minnelli welcomed their first child, Lisa Minnelli, into the world. This momentous occasion was met with widespread joy and optimism. Many believed that motherhood would provide Garland with an opportunity to save her life beyond her demanding career, offering a respite from the pressures of being solely defined as a worker in the entertainment industry.
The arrival of Liza Minnelli indeed seemed to usher in a sense of domestic bliss for Judy Garland. The prospect of having a family to care for and someone to care about her beyond her celebrity persona promised a new chapter of fulfillment. Garland appeared to have it all a loving family, and a successful career that continued to garner acclaim. However, the delicate balance between personal happiness and professional demands proved elusive. MGM embarked on the production of a new film, The Pirate, casting Judy Garland alongside Gene Kelly. In an effort to shed the weight gained during her pregnancy, Garland returned to her pills, reigniting her struggle with addiction. The combination of impatience, sleeping pills, and the pressures of the film set led to a resurgence of Garland's addiction, manifesting in new symptoms of erratic behavior. The insidious side effects of amphetamines began to cast a dark shadow over Judy Garland's life, particularly during the filming of The Pirate. Paranoia, one of the well-known consequences of amphetamine use, manifested in alarming ways on set. Garland's fragile mental state reached a breaking point when she started perceiving harmless bonfires as malevolent entities. In a harrowing scene, she screamed in terror, convinced that those around her intended to burn her alive, a chilling echo of Joan of Arc facing the stake. This episode of paranoia marked a distressing downturn in Garland's mental and emotional well-being. The film set, once a place of creativity, and collaboration, became a stage for the torment induced by the very substances she had become dependent on. Unable to distinguish reality from her drug-fueled perceptions, Garland had to be escorted away from the set and taken home, revealing the severity of her deteriorating mental health. Surrounded by a complex network of individuals, Garland found herself in the company of Yes People, Individuals who may have seemed like friends on the surface, but, in reality, were part of a destructive cycle that enabled her addiction. Their compliance with her desires, whether out of genuine friendship or a misguided attempt to protect her, contributed to the unraveling of Garland's life. Her demeanor became a precarious dance between moments of loving affection and the stark reality of substance abuse. Those close to her could discern when she had taken her pills and the stark contrast between her sober and medicated states painted a poignant picture of the internal struggles she faced. In 1947, Judy Garland's deteriorating health and escalating drug addiction led to a critical juncture in her life. Recognizing the urgency of her situation, she was sent to the hospital for recovery and rehabilitation. This marked a pivotal moment for Garland as she grappled with the profound challenges posed by her addiction. Despite the setbacks, 1947 also saw Judy Garland making a triumphant return to the screen with the film Easter Parade, which proved to be a massive success. This success, however, was overshadowed by the persistent struggles Garland faced with her growing dependence on drugs. As 1949 rolled around, MGM extended an offer for Garland to star in Annie Get Your Gun. However, this opportunity became a double-edged sword as the symptoms of her escalating drug addiction intensified. The toll of the pills became evident, leading to the distressing side effect of hair loss. The cumulative effect of the medications compelled her to take increasingly higher doses, pushing her to the brink. The sheer volume of pills she was consuming had reached a dangerous level, a dosage that could have proven fatal for many others. In response to her escalating struggles, MGM took action and suspended Judy Garland. She was sent to a hospital for a period of sobriety and rehabilitation. The time away allowed her to regain her physical and mental health, and when she returned to Los Angeles after her recovery, she did so completely sober, a significant achievement. However, the challenges persisted. The studio, preoccupied with the image it sought to project, took issue with Garland's modest weight gain during her healthy rehabilitation. In a cruel twist, the studio demanded that she slim down, pushing Garland back into the destructive cycle of using pills to meet unrealistic standards. 
Faced with this pressure, she relapsed into her old habits, undoing the progress she had made during her recovery. By 1961, Judy Garland embarked on a remarkable resurgence, defying doctors who had declared that she could never sing again. Her triumphant return to the stage at Carnegie Hall left audiences and critics astounded, with some even rising from their chairs in sheer excitement. This incredible feat earned her multiple awards and Grammys, solidifying her place as a legendary musical performer. The success continued on the big screen, where Garland starred in two more feature films, receiving critical acclaim for her performances. However, the unpredictable nature of Garland's life took another turn, and her professional demeanor began to waver once again. In her next film, she reverted to old habits, showing up late and sparking arguments among the cast. Despite the roller coaster of her career, Judy Garland found a new avenue for her talents television. In 1963, she embarked on her own show, The Judy Garland Show where she invited celebrities for interviews and even featured her own children on several episodes. While the show initially garnered attention, it eventually became redundant, leading to fluctuating audience interest. In 1964, the studio decided not to renew the show, leaving Garland in a state of financial and emotional distress. Facing financial ruin despite the substantial income generated by her show, Garland struggled to cope. Her sister became a vital source of support, but even with tens of millions of dollars from the show, she found herself broke after its cancellation. This financial turmoil exacerbated her fragile mental state, leading to another mental breakdown. Garland checked into a hospital but eventually checked out. With her personal life in disarray and her career on the decline, Garland faced the challenges of a difficult divorce from her third husband, Sid Luft. Alone and without a stable home, she ventured into a tumultuous marriage with Mark Herron, an aspiring actor who, despite making her laugh, couldn't contend with her frequent fits of rage. The marriage lasted only six months before they separated and divorced, leaving Garland once again without a clear path forward. As her life unraveled, Garland's behavior on film sets became increasingly erratic, leading to dismissals and damaged relationships with colleagues. Her reputation suffered as she continued to show up late to performances and exhibited signs of desperation. On that fateful morning of June 22, 1969, Mickey Deans, Judy Garland's fifth and final husband, made a grim discovery. Knocking on the bathroom door to inform Judy of a call from a friend, he was met with an eerie silence. A deep foreboding compelled him to climb onto the roof to peer through the window, and there he spotted Judy Garland, cold, still as stone. In the aftermath of this tragic revelation, the police were summoned to the scene, their somber declaration confirmed what many had feared. Judy Garland was dead. The cause of her untimely demise was an accidental overdose, a stark reminder that the demons she had battled since her youth had finally exacted their toll. The Dixon Safari, a term harking back to her childhood struggles with amphetamines prescribed by her mother, had caught up with her, leaving a void in the world of entertainment. Judy Garland's life had been marked by a relentless pursuit of perfection, driven by a desire to please her audience and meet the insatiable demands of the industry. She had given and given, pouring her heart and soul into her performances. And in doing so, she had unwittingly become a victim of those who sought to extract more from her than she could bear. Despite the shock that rippled through the world, the truth was, that Judy Garland had not intended to die. Her demise was the tragic culmination of a lifetime struggle with addiction and the toll it took on her body. The very qualities that made her a beloved star, the ability to captivate audiences with her talent and vulnerability, had, in the end, become the forces that contributed to her decline. On June 25, 1969, Judy Garland's body was transported to New York City where a memorial service was held. Fans gathered to mourn the loss of the woman who had given all of herself to them. The metaphorical end of the rainbow 
A symbol of hope and dreams now marked the conclusion of Judy Garland's tumultuous journey. Her legacy, a complex tapestry of triumphs and tribulations, would forever endure as a testament to the highs and lows of a life lived under the relentless spotlight of fame. What do you think about Judy Garland's life? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.